Well, hello, disembodied viewer. You're probably wondering what I'm doing here. So I'll tell you instead what I did yesterday. As COVID stalled the careers of family and friends, I became envious and decided to stall the rest of my life as well by applying to grad school. I targeted the Yamvert School of Economics, the world's most prestigious econ program with a negative 5% acceptance rate. I found out about them two years ago when they rejected me 17 times without me even applying and 23 times when I did. So to make my next application really pop, I decided to pour my life savings into a high budget video production, complete with animations from the quill of the bird manifestation of Walt Disney himself. Here's what I have. Name, Kyle Eschen, age 28, application for the Yamvert School of Economics. I'll be answering question number three. Describe a time when you use supply and demand to assess a real world situation. I was 23 and hawking my wares by the docks. I was the king of the fish market, for only I could summon stingrays in mass. My rare talent kept the supply scarce. With demand ever growing, my prices grew sky high. My status grew in lockstep. I dined with the ocean's finest. And then it happened. The latest oil spill contained a new chemical that coincidentally serves as an explosively potent stingray aphrodisiac. Like most humans, stingrays generally think that stingrays are sexually repulsive. But once the mood was set, the population exploded. Before long, everyone and their mom thought they could sell stingrays. And they could. My product, my skill set, the thing that made me special, had become commonplace. And so dissolved my value to the human race. I knew that I would have to rebuild my status from scratch. I had to seek new friends who were similarly deprived. To make a living, I'd participated in a number of social psychology experiments. They didn't pay cash, but after 20 experiments, you were entitled to a free box of salt licks. And that's where I met Winslow, a fellow that I suspected occupied a similar social tier. But of course, I first had to see if he was a viable friend. For weeks, I scoured his internet presence and conducted several compatibility tests, all under the cloak of extreme secrecy. After I was sure, I approached Winslow to enter initial negotiations on the terms of our friendship. I explained to Winslow that there is little social demand for people with our personalities and ample supply. While he was originally reluctant, I eventually swayed Winslow to my line of reasoning. Winslow was sufficiently terrified to begin a trial period of friendship. We got along famously. I look back at that interval that followed as the golden summer of my life. But all that changed come autumn, when one of my videos went viral. Thousands of people saw the world's worst meditation retreat. Thousands! That's an order of magnitude more people than ancestral man would meet in their lifetime. And suddenly there were demands on my time. People wanted to see me. I realized my social value had catapulted beyond Winslow's social strata. I mean, he still used discount mayo. We can no longer be friends. But at some point I had developed a feeling of fondness for Winslow and I wanted him to remain in my life. I decided to teach him my former skill set of stingray summoning, knowing that if he climbed that hierarchy, he would meet my status and allow for our continued association. And soon the student eclipsed the teacher, and did he ever. On his first try, he lured old Betty landward, the Holy Grail. Winston was killed, not on the initial flop, but in the subsequent sneak attack. He of course became a viral sensation, and now that our statuses have converged, our friendship can continue. And that's why I always keep his ashes around. To remind me what really matters. Please accept me. Mm -hmm.